Hey, Leisha, you are on mute actually currently. Aloha mai kako. I'd like to welcome you all to the US Fish and Wildlife Services virtual public meeting for the proposed designation of critical habitat for EEV. We are gonna give folks a few minutes here to join the meeting and then we'll begin the PowerPoint presentation shortly. So please stay tuned. I do want to note that closed captioning is available by selecting the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you are using the Zoom web portal or Zoom app on your computer. Again, welcome everyone to today's uh, meeting. We are gonna give folks a few more minutes to join the meeting. So please stay tuned and we will start the presentation shortly. Again, I do want to note that closed captioning is available by selecting the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you are using the Zoom web portal or Zoom app on your computer. Well, it looks like we're about three minutes after the hour. And I'd like to begin by again welcoming everyone. Aloha kako. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to offer an oli or chant to open the space for us tonight. Ua lu kini kini ka hua o hi ale hua mai o a o lono nuya ke a hali hali ia ia ka e hulu ma ka ni hi i po ia e ka poli ma hana o ka ne hua o ho nuya me a ua ua mole. Ua mo hala ela, oka apapane, oka mamu, oka nuku i ivi, oka ahi, mai hiki lalo ai hiki luna e waiho ne i hali i mokula, ua ike ai a hele ono i Mahalo, mahalo, thank you for being here again. Just a couple of logistics. I'd like to call everyone's attention to the services EEV proposed critical habitat project page listed at the bottom of the slide there, you see. Tonight's presentation and recording will be found at this address, again, listed on the bottom there of the slide. We'll add this link to the Zoom chat as well. Adli? Ali, would you like to start us off? Sure, yeah, thank you, Leisha. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time and participation this evening. My name is Ali Yamnitsky, and I'm with Environmental Management and Planning Solutions Incorporated. Uh, we are a contractor with the service, and this evening I'm going to be one of your meeting facilitators. Tonight's meeting is being hosted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I have several members of the service with me tonight who will be answering your questions and listening to your public comments, including members of their management team. You already heard from Leisha Lynn Salbosa, and I'm now going to turn it over to Drew Crane to introduce all members of the services team. Drew? Thanks, Ali. <clears throat> so good evening, everyone. My name is Drew Crane, and I'm the Acting Deputy Field Supervisor for the Pacific Islands Fish and Wildlife Office. With us this evening, we have Leisha Lynn Salbosa, our classification program manager and presenter for this evening, along with Nenea Valaros, our public affairs specialist, Jay Nelson and Keelan Barcina, our fish and wildlife biologists on this project. And finally, we have Nachanon Ketram 
from our headquarters office, serving as the species assessment team project manager. Our ex expected agenda for the meeting tonight is as follows. Ali Amnitsky will first go over some brief ground rules for tonight's meeting. The service will then provide a PowerPoint presentation on the proposed critical habitat, which will last approximately 45 minutes. Then the service will answer any questions you may have about the presentation during a 15 minute Q&A session. We will then begin our verbal public comment portion of the meeting, starting at 7 p.m. Hawaii time and continuing until 8 p.m. To be clear, the service has several subject matter experts available to answer questions during the designated Q&A portion of the meeting. But when the formal public hearing begins at 7 p.m., the comments received during this time will be collected for the record and the service staff will not respond to these comments this evening. All comments received during this public hearing and the open public comment period will be fully considered by the service before any final rule is published. And with that, I will hand it back to Ellie. Thanks, Drew. Before we go ahead and get started with the presentation, I just wanted to review some ground rules for tonight's meeting. First, this meeting is being recorded as part of the project record, and our recording will be posted to the US Fish and Wildlife website. Second, your microphones and videos will remain turned off for the duration of the meeting today. You will only be unmuted if and when I unmute you during the question and answer session, if you are a phone caller, or during the verbal public comment portion of the meeting, if you wish to provide a comment. Questions will be addressed during the question and answer session after the PowerPoint presentation. We will do our best to address the questions in the order they come in to allow everyone an opportunity to voice their questions. Instructions on how to submit questions electronically during the session will be provided after, after the services presentation. We will allow those joining by computer to submit questions electronically and those joining by phone to submit questions verbally as they do not have access to the chat feature to submit questions electronically. We do ask that you keep questions related to the scope of the presentation. After the question and answer session, we will then move on to the virtual public hearing portion of the meeting, during which we will accept verbal public comments from participants who have joined tonight's meeting. If you registered before the start time of tonight's meeting and indicated that you wanted to offer a verbal public comment today, you are on, are on our list of pre-registered commenters and will be called on during the public comment portion. If you registered after the meeting started, we will do our best to reserve time for you to have an opportunity to offer your verbal public comment today. If we have time remaining after we have gone through our list of pre-registered commenters, we will have the verbal public comment portion of the meeting open to anyone who would like to offer a verbal public comment who has not already done so, regardless of whether you selected yes or no to commenting when you registered for today's meeting. If you do not get the opportunity to offer your verbal comment today, written public comments can be submitted electronically at regulations.gov or via hard copy. Both the website and mailing address will be given during today's presentation and will be available in the chat. The comment period will be open through February 27th and we will provide further information on how to submit your written public comments after the presentation. I will now turn it back over to Leisha and she's gonna lead us through the Fish and Wildlife Services PowerPoint presentation. Leisha. Thank you, Ali. What brings us here this evening is that we, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is proposing critical habitat for the EEV. The EEV was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 2017. What that means is that EEV are likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. And I will talk a bit about EEV abundance and distribution across the Hawaiian Islands in a moment. Our proposal identifies three islands and a total of 275,647 acres as essential areas for the conservation of the EV. As part of our proposal, we are seeking comments from the public to help us make a more informed decision. 
This map here provides an overview of our proposed designation on the islands of Kauai, Maui, and Hawaii Island. Later in the presentation, we will examine these seven regional areas in detail. Why are we proposing critical habitat? The Fish and Wildlife Service has a statutory obligation or requirement to determine critical habitat within one year of listing a species under the Endangered Species Act. We have had and continue to have legal complaints filed against the service for failing to designate critical habitat in a timely manner. Our proposal to designate critical habitat for EEV is in response to a legal complaint filed by the Center for Biological Diversity in 2021. Lastly, critical habitat is an important conservation tool to publicly identify areas on the landscape that are essential to the conservation of a species, in this case, EEV. Before we get into the details of the proposed designation, I think it's important to highlight this remarkable bird. Pictured here is a comparison photo of what a young EEV and an adult EEV look like. Undoubtedly, our native Hawaiian culture has a deep reverence for EEV. EEV are important pollinators for our forests and have forged interdependent relationships with our native plants for millennia. EEV were once present from sea level all the way up to our forested areas. This map here illustrates the range contraction that EEV have experienced. You can see how prevalent EEV once were, shown in the light green, versus where they are found today, shown in the dark green. I will talk about the reasons for the range contraction in a moment. When we examine the areas where EEV remain, we saw a diverse set of ecosystems and features, including montane wet and music forests, some high elevation dryland forests, and less pristine areas with introduced flowering trees, all utilized by EEV. EEV feed on patches of flowering ohia and require tall stature trees for nesting. Their breeding is primarily October through August, coinciding with peak ohia flowering. The primary reason for the range contraction that was illustrated in the earlier map is because of avian disease. Avian diseases, primarily avian malaria, is spread by the southern house mosquito and an infection can be fatal to an EEV. As temperatures rise and the air becomes warmer in our higher elevation forested areas, mosquitoes are able to move into the forested areas that were once mosquito free. Other threats to EEV include the disease referred to as rapid ohia death or the fungal pathogen caused by the fungal pathogen Sarocystis, which has resulted in significant loss of our ohia forests in some areas. All of this information provides a necessary foundation, a very necessary foundation, as we get into the details of our proposed designation. As mentioned at the outset, we have identified seven regional areas that represent regional subpopulations of EEV, pictured here in yellow. These areas are what we are proposing as critical habitat for EEV. But what exactly is critical habitat? Critical habitat is one tool used to guide cooperation within the federal government to help conserve threatened or endangered species. Critical habitat only affects federal agency actions or federally funded or permitted activities. Critical habitat requires the federal agency to consult with the service, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, if the federal action could harm EEV habitat. Critical Habitat recommends federal agencies 
to adopt conservation measures to restore and protect, in this case, BEV habitat. Critical habitat does not give the Fish and Wildlife Service access to private lands. Critical habitat does not prevent development. And finally, critical habitat does not create reserves or protected areas on the landscape. Before we get into further discussing critical habitat, I'd like to talk about specifically our proposal. Our critical habitat proposal is based on the best available field surveys that began in 1986 and done again in 2012, published by Scott et al. and Paxson et al. respectively. Those literature citations are available with the proposed designation as supporting documents. We also utilized our species status report completed in 2016 and the recovery plan for EEV, which was completed in November of 2022. We used density estimates to identify the best of the best in terms of EEV habitat. In order to prioritize connectivity and allow for adequate foraging area, we ensured proposed units were large enough to support an estimated number of 5,000 birds based on literature of effective population size. Effective population size refers to the ideal number of individuals needed to maintain a population. Finally, we did not include smaller parcels that were discontinuous from larger areas and absent of EEV habitat features. Based on our criteria and information on EEV biology, we identified what is called physical or biological features features that make the habitat essential for EEV. And those two features that we identified are listed here on the screen. Ohia or other tall stature trees are required for nesting. Multiple patches of seasonally flowering trees or shrubs are required for foraging. We also considered conservation biology factors of resiliency, redundancy, and representation when determining quantity and distribution of the proposed critical habitat. We found that the areas currently occupied by EEV are adequate to ensure the conservation of the species. Therefore, we are not proposing areas outside the geographical area currently occupied by EEV, meaning we are not proposing areas that were historically occupied by EEV, only areas that are currently occupied by EEV. As part, of the, as part of identifying physical or biological features that make the area essential for EEV, we also identified what is called special management considerations or protections that would allow EEV to continue to use the critical habitat area. Listed here are those special management considerations. These are management actions to benefit EEV critical habitat. Some of these listed here include removal of invasive plants and habitat management to reduce fire risk, as well as containment or removal or exclusion of un feral ungulates on the landscape. These are not requirements or requested actions. These are simply identified as important management actions to consider in order to conserve EEV critical habitat. We will now go into the seven regional proposed critical habitat units, starting first with Kauai. Kauai contains one area that we are proposing as critical habitat. It includes a total of 12,000 acres and a mix of public acres and private acres as shown there on the screen. Most of the habitat here on Kauai overlaps with already existing critical habitat for several listed plant species on the island. Next, we have Maui here, and we have two regional areas or regional populations here identified. Kula unit, covering a total of 5,226 acres, and the East Halekala unit, 
covering approximately 19,000 acres. And there you can also see that much of this area already overlaps with existing critical habitat, primarily for our listed plants. Moving on to Hawaii Island, we have four units here, starting with the Windward Hawaii unit, pictured there on the screen, covering a total of 141,000 acres. The Ka'u unit and the South Kona unit, pictured there on the screen, consisting of a mix of public and private areas. The North Kona unit finally, consisting of approximately 13,000 acres. In total, the proposed designation for EEV on Hawaii Island covers about 238,000 acres. Hawaii Island is the stronghold of the EEV population in the islands. Providing an overview here, we have the proposed designation here across all seven regional areas. Under section 4B2 of the Endangered Species Act, we are allowed to exclude certain areas from critical habitat if after a careful weighing analysis, we determine that the benefits of excluding an area outweigh the benefits of including an area. And things we consider in that weighing analysis or evaluation is permitted and non-permitted conservation plans or partnerships already occurring on the landscape or on the parcel. And what we're gonna talk about in these next two slides are our list of considered exclusions, which we've identified in our proposed designation. And we welcome public comments on this component of considered exclusions. In this table here, we have our list of area acres and the regional unit, the proposed regional unit of which we are considering ex excluding. Here's the final list of considered exclusions. As you can tell, there are quite an array of considered exclusions. This is simply because we have a great deal of conservation partnerships across Hawaii and that which we are actually proud of. A total of 57,361 acres are considered for exclusion out of the total of 275,000 acres. So in hearing all of that information, how exactly will critical habitat designation help EEV? Well, critical habitat is a tool that supports the continued conservation of imperiled species by guiding cooperation within the federal government. It raises awareness of the habitat needs of imperiled species and focuses efforts of our conservation partners. Identifying these areas <clears throat> helps to inform landowners and the public which specific areas are important to a species conservation and recovery. In summary, our proposed rule or our proposed designation identifies 275,647 acres across Kauai, Maui, and Hawaii as essential areas needed for the conservation of EEV. It breaks down to about 78% public land and 22% private land. The reason why we're doing this is we have a statutory responsibility to determine critical habitat within one year of listing a species. And we also use critical habitat to improve awareness of areas essential for EV conservation. Critical habitat was determined using the best available scientific and commercial information, habitat features for nesting and foraging, EV population density and habitat connectivity. And as I mentioned earlier, 57,361 acres within this designation is considered for exclusion based on permitted and non-permitted conservation plans or partnerships under section 4B2 of the Endangered Species Act.
We are here this evening and we are here during this public comment period seeking comments on the proposed rule from a variety of entities and organizations. We are seeking comments relating to, but not limited to, reasons why we should or should not designate critical habitat, why specific areas should or should not be considered for exclusion under ESA section 4B2, whether critical habitat designation could increase risk to EEV. And we're also seeking comments on specific information on EEV abundance and distribution. Finally, this slide has uh, additional information of how you may submit comments to, uh, to this process. And we'll also be providing this information again at the conclusion of tonight's meeting. In, in conclusion, this on the screen, we have our project page for EEV critical habitat for our proposed designation, which offers additional information. And we also have our Department of the Interior strategy for preventing the extinction of wine forest birds as background information for interested individuals. And at this time, that concludes the informational presentation portion of this evening. And I'd like to hand it back to Ali. Thanks, Leisha. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Ali Amnitsky, and I'm with EMPSI, a contractor with the service. Uh, today, I'm going to be the moderator for the question and answer session and our verbal public comment session. We're now going to begin the Q&A portion of tonight's meeting. This Q&A portion will last approximately 15 minutes, and the intent is is to answer any substantive questions you may have for the Fish and Wildlife Service staff on the presentation. We do ask that you keep any questions uh, that you may have related just to the presentation. We will do our best to answer questions in the order that they are received. I will first go over instructions for how to submit a question using the chat function if you are joining us this evening from the Zoom web platform or the Zoom app. At this time, if you have a question and you are using the Zoom web platform or the Zoom app, please go ahead and click on the chat icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen, the chat icon should appear. You may need to exit your full screen view in Zoom to see this icon. I have included a graphic on the screen of where you can find this icon. You can then type your question into the chat box and please send it to the hosts and panelists. I will then read the question aloud for all participants to hear and a US Fish and Wildlife Service staff member will respond to your question aloud. We will try to answer your questions in the order that they are received. However, please note that there may be a pause between asking your question and a staff member answering your question. If you are calling in through the phone and have a question, please press star nine and that will raise your hand and indicate to us that you would like to ask a question. When it is your turn, I will identify you by the last four digits of your phone number. I will then unmute you so that you can ask your question. Again, a US Fish and Wildlife Service staff member will then respond to your question aloud. You may also be muted on your end, and if this is the case, we will prompt you to unmute yourself by pressing star six. And with that, we will go ahead and begin answering some questions. Um, we do have some questions coming in through the chat, so we do appreciate your patience as we gather our answers for those. All right, so our first question this evening is, is critical habitat designation for federal lands or does it apply to state and private lands also? And we will go to Leisha for the answer on that. Thank you for this question. Yes, critical habitat designation applies to both federal, state and private lands. There is no ownership requirement Critical habitat designation is based on the best available scientific and commercial data based on the biological needs of the species. So it, 
applies to both state and private lands, as well as federal. Great, thanks for that answer, Alicia. Again, we just appreciate your patience as we develop the answers to the questions that have started coming in through the chat. All right, our second question is, why just the EEV? There are many other endangered honey creepers. And we'll go back to Laisha for the answer on that. Thank you for that question and your interest. You're absolutely right. There are many, many uh, endangered birds, plants throughout the islands. And with this um, particular proposal, we are only focusing on EEV but we do have and we do work on critical habitat designations for all of our endangered honeycreepers. We have worked on and designated critical habitat for our endangered akohe kohe on Maui. And so it is just EEV for only this particular project. But again, we are required by statute to determine critical habitat for all listed species, including honeycreepers, within one year of listing them. And so that is absolutely right. We are working on critical habitat for many species. All right, so our third question is, can you talk more about why critical habitat designation is not designed to expand the EEV habitat? They have lost a tremendous amount, so why not reclaim more? They need all the help we can give. And we'll go to Leisha on that. Yes, thank you again for that question. Critical habitat designation is not a on the ground restoration tool. It identifies areas on the landscape that are essential for the conservation of a species. So to get back to your question, critical habitat designation is, is not designed to expand EV habitat. Critical habitat designation identifies essential areas on the landscape that are necessary to conserve a species. But thank you. All right, our fourth question is, some lands in South Kona that appear to meet your criteria have already been excluded. What was the reason for these exclusions? And we'll go to Leisha. Yes, with this particular question, um, it seems that your question is in regards to why this area had been excluded in the past under a separate critical habitat designation. And I believe that to be outside of our scope for this evening, if that was the question intended.
All right, and that is currently all the questions that we have received in the chat. Uh, we do have about 15 minutes set aside for this question and answer session, and we've gone through about 10 minutes of it so far. So I do just want to note that if anyone has any additional questions that they would like to ask, please go ahead and wrap them into the chat now. And we'll wait a few minutes or so for those to come in. And again, if you are joining by phone and you would like to ask a question, you can go ahead and press star nine on your keypad and that will indicate to us that you would like to ask a question and I will then go ahead and unmute you for you to ask that question. Our fifth question of the evening is, how long is a critical habitat designation effective? Can areas be undesignated in perpetuity? And we'll go to Leisha for the answer. Thank you for that question. That's a very important question. Uh, critical habitat designation is done through a federal rulemaking process and so one of the first steps is we're proposing to designate critical habitat for EEV. And through the public comment period, we'll collect comments and consider comments and then, propose, and then do a final designation through federal rulemaking process. So to answer your question, areas may be undesignated, but that must go through a federal rulemaking process to do that. Our next question is, when and how do you contact the leases of designated critical habitat? Leisha? Thanks, Ali. Yes, at the outset of our process, when we begin to develop proposed critical habitat for a species, we send out letters to our partners, to landowners, and then we also meet with and discuss with landowners following the proposed publication of the designation. And we do our best to collaborate, work with, and hear from landowners. That's very important for us.
All right, our next question is, the EEV density data appears, appears to primarily come from the breeding bird survey. Is there any data on non-breeding habitat usage included in determining critical habitat? And you know, we'll go to Leisha. Thanks, Ali. Yes, that's a very um, technical question, a very good question. Um, the density surveys, the field surveys um, that we used in uh, as one of the elements in, in our proposal um, is focused on the density, the abundance of EEV. And so it did include both breeding and non-breeding birds. And that's a really good question. And I'm going to note that we follow up with that question um, in the future as we work through our comments. We're going to note that question. Thank you. And thank you folks for um, being patient as we work through the questions and moderate and facilitate this. Thank you. Yeah, and I do want to note that that was the last question that has come in through the chat. So I'll give it another 30 seconds or so before we go ahead and move on to our verbal public comment session. All right, so I don't see any more questions coming in and we have reached about 15 minutes for this question and answer session. So at this time, I'm now going to move us along to the public comment portion of tonight's meeting. So we're now going to officially start the verbal public hearing portion of today's meeting to receive comments related to the proposed critical habitat for the EEV. The time is now 6.45 Hawaii time, so let's get started. Again, this verbal public comment portion of the meeting, along with your comments, is being recorded as part of the official record. As a reminder, your camera and microphone control settings are restricted during this time. You will only be able to talk if and when you are unmuted, so please remember to speak when prompted. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wants to hear from all members of the public who are interested in voicing their comment. So today we will be using the following guidelines. First, please be mindful of the length of your comment so that everyone who wishes to speak has an opportunity to do so today. We have four pre-registered commenters. Each commenter will have approximately three minutes to provide their comment. We will provide a reminder if you have reached that three minutes to shortly wrap up your comment after that. Second, please be respectful of others and their viewpoints. Third, please refrain from using any profanity. While passion is welcome in your comment, policy requires that we mute anyone who uses inappropriate language because we are recording this meeting and others may be live streaming. So again, please try to avoid inappropriate language. If that does occur, we will provide a reminder before unmuting the person to try again using words acceptable to all ages. I'm now going to read through the instructions for those participants who indicated they wanted to offer a verbal public comment when they pre-registered for today's meeting. We have a list of participants and commenters uh, and comments will be accepted in the order that the folks registered. Again, if you registered before the start time of today's meeting, you received a separate email informing you that you'd be called upon to offer your verbal public comment. This email also included your place in the commenter list. If you are on the commenter list, when it is your turn to provide your comment, we will read your name aloud from the list and display your name on the screen. 
we will also display the name of the next commenters who are next in line. When you hear your name called out, please use the raise hand feature so that we know you are available and ready to offer your comment. You can access the raise hand feature by clicking on either the reactions icon or the participants list icon, which are both located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wave your mouse back and forth across the bottom of the screen, these icons should appear. You may need to exit out of your full screen view to see these icons. You can then select the raise hand feature located either in the reactions icon or at the bottom of your participants list. Or if you are calling in through the phone, you can press star nine and that will also access the raise hand feature. Once you have raised your hand, you will then be unmuted so that you can provide your verbal public comment. You may be double muted. If that's the case, we will prompt you to unmute yourself on your end so that we can hear you. This may show up as a box on your screen um, that says the host is asking you to unmute. When you have confirmed audio, please spell out your first and last name for the record before providing your verbal public comment. And if you are representing an organization or group, please state that during your comment. After you have provided your comment, we will mute you and move on to our next commenter. Again, once we have worked our way through the current list of pre-registered commenters, if we have time, we will move on to those who registered after the start time of today's meeting and selected that they would like to offer a comment. If we have time remaining after that, we will open up the verbal public comment portion of today's meeting to anyone who would like to offer a comment who has not already done so. Again, we currently have four pre-registered commenters. As such, each commenter will have approximately three minutes to provide their comment. And lastly, I do wanna remind folks that the comment period is open through February 27th. All right, so uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, the one with the uh, Zoom graphics on it. Thanks. Uh, so on the screen now, I have included some graphics showing participants where they can access that raise hand feature, either the reactions tab or the participants list. All right. So we'll now go ahead and get started. Our first commenter of the evening is Zachary Judd. Zachary, if you are with us this evening and wish to provide public comment, please go ahead and access that raise hand feature. And that will indicate to me that you would like to provide a comment. All right, and I see you've raised your hand. I'm now going to allow you to unmute yourself. Once done, please go ahead and confirm you have audio before spelling your first and last name for the record, and then you may begin your comment. Hi, can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. All right, uh, so first name is Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, last name is J-U-D-D. -D. You can go ahead and provide your comment now, thank you. All right, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Zachary Judd and I'm currently the forestry manager at Parker Ranch Inc. I want to first uh, take the time and thank Fish and Wildlife Service for the opportunity to present comment on this important issue. Parker Ranch broadly supports the effort by Fish and Wildlife Service to designate areas of critical habitat that is uh, critical to the survival of the EV, our most iconic native forest bird species in Hawaii. However, we do not support the designation of the EV critical habitat on the ranch's agriculturally zoned Waipunalea parcel. Waipunale has a long and storied history with the ranch and is actively being managed by our in-house forestry program guided by a sustainable co-op forestry management plan. We are working closely together with a variety of partners on this property, including Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance, DLNR Division of Forestry and Wildlife, and more recently, the NRCS. Since 2017, over a million dollars of internal funds has gone into fencing the property, removing invasive ungulates, controlling invasive weed species and native species outplanting. 
Broadly speaking, forest cover on private property is directly linked to the economic value of trees. It is when that economic value is not present or lost that land use transitions to other forms of agricultural production. Hawaii saw this when cattle were introduced and saw widespread loss of forest cover for the production of meat. It was further exacerbated when sugar and pineapple industries started and converted vast tracts of native forest into agricultural land. And we see it today continuing in places like the Amazon, Africa, and Southeast Asia, mirroring Hawaii's paths, path over the last 200 years. Today, we are blessed with the fact that two of Hawaii's keystone native tree species have some of the highest economic values out of any timber species worldwide. This economic value has led to tens of thousands of acres of native forest being planted on private property over the last 50 years, which have been a pivotal, have been pivotal to the expansion of habitat for our native forest birds. This trend is expected to continue as more and more landowners see the value in our native forest species and move away from cattle and diverse, diversified ag. This positive land use trajectory is at risk by the designation of critical habitat on private property which would, with a federal nexus, Fish and Wildlife Service recommends limiting forest extraction year round to avoid adverse modification, even though the listed threats to EEV do not include forest extraction. This recommendation by the service would force landowners who wish to plant trees with a federal assistance with the hopes of creating a sustainable working forest to instead look towards other land uses, lead to forest stagnation, urban development, or possible land sales. Simply put, we are staunch believers that our sustainable forestry program has tremendous long-term ecological and environmental benefits that are simply unmatched by any other agricultural land use. Combining those values with best management practices along with avoidance and mitigation measures allows for a sustained level of forest cover in perpetuity free from feral ungulates and with dynamic management of invasive species. This is truly bridging the gap between conservation and agriculture. And the only way we see large sustainable increases to forest habitat happening in Hawaii. Hey, Zach, I'm yep. so sorry. Uh, we've, we've hit three minutes. Um, so at this point, I'm going to ask you to pause your comment um, just so we can get through the rest of the pre-registered. And then when we do open the floor, um, I can invite you back to finish your comment. I have like two sentences left. Okay, go ahead. Um, so as with most private landowners, Parker Ranch has demonstrated the stewardship of its lands and plays a leading role in landscape scale conservation partnerships across Hawaii Island, including Kuala Watershed Partnership, Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance, various community organizations and direct working relationships and technical assistance with DLNR and NRCS. As such, we feel EEV critical habitat is unwarranted on our property and that land stewardship actions show that we are open to collaboratively working with the service on a wide range of voluntary conservation and habitat preservation issues. Thank you for your time. Great, and thanks for your comment, Zach. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and place you back on mute and lower your hand. And we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter. And that would be Keith Robinson. Keith, if you are on and would like to provide a comment this evening, please go ahead and access that raise hand feature. Again, that's gonna be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And looks like you found it. I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to unmute. Again, please go ahead and confirm that you have audio and then uh, spell your name for the record. Then you may go ahead and provide your comment. Yes. Keith Robinson, K-E-I-T-H-R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. -O -O uh, representing the Kauai Wildlife Reserve, which is my private uh, personal wildlife reserve. I've, uh, I've got about 35 or 40 years of field work with Hawaii's most highly endangered species. And in the process, I've formed some, had a lot of experience and formed some pretty strong opinions. You won't like those opinions. 
Now, here's my summary comment about the proposed EV habitat listing. Based on my personal knowledge and experience, I believe that this is a huge lie, one that is yet another environmentalist attack on Hawaii's private landowners. And I could use an even stronger word than that. The reasons for my views, A, Hawaii, the government is Hawaii's biggest landowner, the federal and state combined. They, they have about 42% of Hawaii's land mass. That, uh, that comes out to about three and a half million acres. The government at all levels is trying to create a national socialist police state that I refer to as the Fourth Reich. Instead of tending to the mess on their own lands, they uh, go after the, uh, the private landowners. As part of that agenda, endangered species are deliberately being used to undermine and destroy private property rights in Hawaii. Hawaii's environmental community will not hesitate to lie, to twist facts, and to conceal information in pursuit of their goals. Here's a brief discussion of the re uh, reasons for my beliefs. A, the McCandless Ranch fiasco. The McCandless Ranch uh, owners saved one, one population of Hawaiian crows when other people, including the government and the environmentalists had lost them everywhere else. The 5,200 acres of McCandless Ranch land were seized as a result. And then the Econazis botched everything and lost the crows anyway. My statement as I started, I was aware of this as I started my own reserve and I said I would do all the work, pay all the bills, run all the physical risks. And I said I would also give free cuttings and seeds to anyone who wanted to, uh, uh, to grow them. But I would raise and destroy the whole place if, if the government tried to seize it. I was assured the government does not seize private lands that contain listed endangered species. And I was mocked for being paranoid. In 1994-95, the I grew a a plant, a tree that neither the Fish and Wildlife Service nor anyone else had ever grown of the the last of its kind on the on Kauai. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed a uh, published a draft proposal to uh, to seize and manage uh, to secure and manage my reserve. Uh, I had warned them not to do such things. 72 hours later, that tree was mysteriously found dead. In 2000-2002, the Econazis returned to the attack with more critical habitat listings. This time, the casualties were 32 Kokiakawaiensis trees, the last healthy uh, grove of such trees anywhere in the world. Four Kokia Kokiai trees, which were just entering into seeding and produced a thousand seeds, they were gone also, and a colony of Kamehameha butterflies that depended on those trees. They also died out when I decided to let it go. The present situation, the Kauai Wildlife Reserve is once more growing officially listed species that the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Econazis have never grown, but everything is carefully kept ready to be wiped out if there are any attempts to seize the place. I can have it gone in a hurry. Returning to my original opinions, uh, statement of opinion based on my past experience, this proposed listing will not prevent the continued relentless decline of the iwi birds. It will only give the Econazis, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the environmental activists, and especially the uh, lawyers, for those organizations, an official excuse to attack any private landowners whose lands contain iwi birds. And this is a very important point. Fish and Wildlife likes to claim that this will not affect private landowners, this listing. That is a lie. It gives the environmentalist, uh, environmentalists a perfect, the government and the environmentalists a perfect excuse to attack private landowners and to try to seize private property as happened with the 5,200 acres of the McCandless Ranch lands. Accordingly, in doing my work, I keep it ready for instant destruction. That's all I have to say. Great. Thank you so much for that comment, Keith.
I'm going to go ahead and place you back on mute and I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our next commenter. Nicholas Koch. Uh, Nicholas, I see you have your hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to unmute yourself. Again, please go ahead and confirm that you have audio and state your first and last name for the record before providing your comment. Aloha Kako, my name is Nicholas Koch, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S-K-O-C-H. Can everybody hear me? We can, thank you. You may go ahead and provide your comment. Thank you. My name is Nick Koch. I am a forester working for Siglo Forest LLC. We're also known as Paniolo Tonewoods LLC. We are a vertically integrated forestry and wood products company focused on koa wood for musical instruments. I would like to comment on the benefits of commercial forestry projects for native forest recovery. This is in support of the exclusion considerations that you present earlier and consideration of further exclusions in certain circumstances, such as one that we heard earlier this evening. We support the designation of critical habitat, which can be a powerful tool to reduce the risk to listed species, such as EE, especially landscape level deforestation or habitat conversion. However, this tool must be used wisely. There are several innovative forestry projects underway in Hawaii, and we are one of them. Earlier, you heard from another. We operate in the South Kona forest area and have additional native forest planting projects near Waimea. These projects are on former pasture lands, recovering them to native forest cover. Under our process, before we engage in any forestry activity, we, set, we start out with a set of steps to avoid harm to native species and other land resources. Specifically, we engage in an avian survey, a flora survey, and an archeological survey, all of which uh, emerge with recommendations, which are incorporated into a forest management plan with particular consideration to, to listed species and archeological features. These forests and the project areas are then protected by ungulate proof fencing, including skirting, before taking any action within the project area to ensure vigorous regeneration of native species, especially koa and ohia. And of course, as mentioned earlier, ohia specifically is the main food source for ibuvi. We remove all ungulates and keep the area ungulate free to ensure forest regeneration, which is further augmented by native seedling and shrub planting. This has the bonus of removing pig wallows and hoof prints, which are ideal habitats for mosquitoes, which I fully agree are the main vectors and the main reason we're having this conversation at all, is that the mosquitoes are transmitting avian malaria, which is killing the EEV birds. However, all of this, as alluded earlier, is funded by the selective harvest of commercial species, such as koa for us, but also other valuable native species, such as iliahi for others. We support your consideration of lands managed for native forest recovery through selective and sustainable harvest. These projects and others like them promote habitat for EEV. Far from being detrimental, they are helping the forest recover. However, the critical component is that these projects are all commercially based. The designation of critical habitat reduces the incentive for such projects. The status quo, which is former pastures, is not a desired outcome. These patches are slowly degrading over time through fires, weed invasion, and other processes that are, will continue unabated without further action. It is much better to have these projects as partners in forest recovery than to try to reduce their impact through critical habitat designation. Those are my comments and I thank you. Great, thanks so much, Nicholas. I'm gonna go ahead and place you back on mute and lower your hand. And that was our last pre-registered commenter of the evening. So at this time, I want to go ahead and open the floor to anyone else who has joined us this evening who would like to provide comment. 
So if you, even in registration, if you did not uh, select yes for providing a comment, you may still provide comment now. Um, again, you can go ahead and access that raise hand feature via the reactions or participants list tab on your Zoom toolbar. Or if you are joining by phone, you can go ahead and press star nine, and that will also raise your hand. All right, and I see we have Gregory Hendrickson has his hand raised. I'll go ahead and allow you to unmute yourself, Gregory. Um, at that point, please go ahead and confirm you have audio, then state your name for the record before providing your comment. All right, my name is Gregory Hendrickson. That's G-R-E-G-O-R-Y. H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S-O-N. And I'm uh, commenting on behalf of the Kealakekua Mountain Reserve, which is a 9,627 acre property located in South Kona, Hawaii Island. Um, we, like um, uh, Mr. Judd and Mr. Koch, um, also are very supportive of the services um, work to uh, protect the EEV species, to see it recover, and uh, to designate critical habitat in appropriate areas. We uh, are also supportive of the services inclination as evidenced by their uh, proposed rule uh, to exclude the Kealakekua Mountain Reserve as an area for the designation of critical habitat based upon the conservation efforts underway on the, on the reserve. We uh, um, began uh, concerted conservation efforts uh, on this property uh, more than a decade ago with the implementation of a forest legacy conservation easement, which is a perpetual easement that is administered um, and held by the state of Hawaii Division of uh, for Wildlife. And um, under that conservation easement um, and consistent with the policy associated with the Federal Forest Legacy Program, uh, the property is conserved with specifically tailored restrictions to promote um, the uh, sustainable existence of uh, high quality native forest and um, to keep that forest from being converted to non-forest uses. Uh, the Kealakekua Mountain Reserve uh, follows the provisions of that easement and is monitored uh, by the state of Hawaii uh, at least annually uh, to ensure that we are, uh, that all uses are consistent with the terms of the easement and the protection of the property's conservation values. Uh, concurrently with and required by the conservation easement, KMR has a multi-resource management plan, including detailed provisions associated with the management of the forest lands and their conservation and the promotion of wildlife species. Um, the plan was subject to review and comment by DOFA's Forest Stewardship Advisory Committee during a public meeting and revisions to the plan uh, were made to reflect the comments provided in that meeting, accepted by the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And that plan has been in force and being implemented for uh, nearly 10 years now. Additionally, the Kealakekua Mountain Reserve hosts a large nursery that grows native sand, uh, seedlings for landscape scale restoration projects. This nursery has been in operation since 2019 and last year raised more than 150,000 native tree seedlings for forest restoration on Hawaii Island. Uh, over the past four years, 
Uh, the Kalakikua Mountain Reserve has been very active in its own reforestation efforts. Um, the, uh, the su substantial portions of the property have been uh, fenced, uh, consistent with the manner indicated by Mr. Koch earlier for ungulate exclusion. Uh, and um, we have planted more than uh, 1,500 acres, and uh, that includes more than 344,000 native trees that have been planted since September 2018. Uh, we uh, likewise have conducted our uh, bird surveys. Um, those surveys were done. Uh, using the um, historic transects, which I believe were last surveyed on the property uh, previously in 1978. Um, we surveyed those transects and additional transects in 2022 using the Scott et al. bird survey protocol, which was the same protocol that was used in the previous surveys. We uh, will make that survey information available to the service. And while it identified several birds that were uh, doing well on the Kealakikua Mountain Reserve, uh, no EEB were identified in the bird surveys. In fact, the survey notes that both EEB and Alala have been extirpated from the property or can no longer survive in the available habitat. We, of course, hope that that changes over time, but at this point in time, uh, the best available science we have regarding the Kealakikua Mountain Reserve would indicate that there are no populations of EV, EEV present. Um, we uh, continue to advance uh, educational, conservation educational uh, opportunities on our property. And in 2022, the reserve hosted uh, 816 learners, most of which came from the community and local schools, uh, providing them exposure to the importance of native habitat for the protection of native species and their recovery. We believe that these efforts are much more effective in providing uh, public information and enabling the public to understand the importance of these efforts than the designated uh, designation of critical habitat. Uh, KMR is proud of its conservation work and its continued commitment to restoration. We believe that designating critical habitat on the Kalakikua Mountain Reserve is not necessary due to the level of cooperation and conservation work already being done or is planned to be done on the property. Furthermore, we believe that the benefits of the Kealakiku Mountain Reserve's work outweigh the benefits of establishing critical habitat and that the designation of critical habitat will have a chilling effect on KMR's willingness to engage in the assertive voluntary conservation activities it's pursuing. We also believe that uh, the designation of critical habitat can, in fact, um, have an impact on the perceived value of the property um, for future resale purposes, therefore having a meaningful economic impact. Uh, we believe that the Fish and Wildlife Service understands the value of KMR's efforts and the burdens critical habitat designation may cause for KMR for this reason, the Fish and Wildlife Service noted KMR's lands for potential exclusion in the proposed rule. We agree that KMR's land should be excluded. Thank you. Great, and thanks for that comment, Gregory. I'm gonna go ahead and place you back on mute and lower your hand. All right, and again, we have now reached the point of the verbal public comment session where the floor is open. So if you would like to provide a comment today, please go ahead and access that raise hand feature. Again, that's gonna be at the bottom of your Zoom screen along the Zoom toolbar, either under the reactions tab 
or under the participants list. And again, if you are joining by phone, you can go ahead and press star nine and that will raise your hand. At this point, I don't see any hands currently raised. Um, so I do wanna give a few more minutes for folks to go ahead and access that raise hand feature. Um, if you are unable to find that feature, you can always send a chat to us via the chat box. Again, that's gonna be on the Zoom toolbar and we can go ahead and call on you that way as well. So we'll hang tight for a few minutes um, before we go ahead and move on to the rest of the presentation. All right, so at this time, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Um, so I do want to move us along to the closing remarks slide, just so everyone who is here can get the information from those slides as well. Um, I do want to note that the meeting will remain open until 8 p.m. Hawaii time, and myself as, as well as the service will remain on the meeting to accept any further verbal input that folks may have. So while we do move along in the presentation and we're going to move out of the verbal public comment session, we will still be here to accept verbal comments uh, up until 8 p.m. Hawaii time. So at this point, I wanna turn it back over to Leisha to go through some closing remarks, um, and then I'll come back on and again, uh, remind folks that will be here. Thank you so much, Ali. I really appreciate your time, your energy. I really appreciate everyone's time and energy who has attended this evening. And as Ali pointed out, we will remain here to accept verbal comments through 8 p.m. Hawaii time. But at this time, I'd like to provide some closing remarks for those of us on the call. I wanna again, thank you all. Um, the, on the screen here is additional information, further information, repeating information of how you can submit your public comments via hard copy mail, or electronically via regulations.gov. And again, uh, this information is found on our fishandwildlifeservice.gov project website page, the link provided there on the bottom of the screen, as well as in the chat itself. And again, I just wanna sincerely thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you for your time, your energy, and I hope you all have a restful and well weekend. Mahalo. And again, we will remain here throughout 8 p.m. Hawaii time in case anyone has additional verbal comments. Ali? Thanks, Leisha. Yeah, I will come on screen every 10 minutes or so and just remind folks that we are still here and we will be here until 8 p.m. Hawaii time to accept any further verbal comments. So um, at this time, again, if you do find yourself 
uh, wishing to provide a comment, you can go ahead and access that raise hand feature and I will call on you and unmute you to provide that comment.
All right, the time is now 7.30 Hawaii time. And again, I just want to remind folks that we will be here for another 30 minutes until 8 p.m. to accept any further verbal public comment that you may have. Um, our cameras may be off, but we are still here and ready to accept that comment.
All right, the time is now 7.40 Hawaii time. And again, just want to remind folks that we will still be here until 8 p.m. to accept any further verbal public comment that you may have.
All right, and once again, the time is now 7.50 Hawaii time, and we are still here to accept any further verbal public comment that folks may have. We'll be here for another 10 minutes or so, just until the top of the hour.
All right, the time is now 8 p.m. Hawaii time, and the meeting has come to a close. Again, thank you everyone for joining the meeting this evening and for your participation. I'm going to now go ahead and close out the webinar.